Uh, so we've been on a series here. My series has been Free from the Power of Sin. And in, in this, we're going to continue uh, this topic today. And uh, what a powerful series that if we'll let it get a hold of us and we'll put in place the different elements, God allows for us to be set free from the power of sin, then great and mighty things can happen in our life. Well, I want to review just a little bit, if I may. And I don't know, it sounds like I got a little bit of a barrel roll going on in the sound, so just kind of make that mention. Um, listen, over the course of the last few weeks, we've been talking about uh, free from the power of sin, and the very first message, I'm going to give you one word, and in that series, I used the word mortify, right, to mortify the flesh, and we talked about what it means to mortify the flesh, and again, you may have some preconceived ideas what that needs to look like or what the scripture means by that, but I would encourage you to go back into uh, onto YouTube or onto Facebook or wherever you can make your connection and go back and listen to the message, the very first message. The second message I had uh, preached on uh, the area of renewal and talked about how that we all want to have that point of being renewed. The scripture says uh, that we pray God renew our strength and to be renewed, to have a reset. You remember that? We talked about reset. Being able to reset or renew that which needs to be renewed. And of course we said that that only comes from Christ and Him alone. We present ourselves to God in prayer seeking for His renewal because it's, we can't be renewed in our own strength. If you find you're renewing in your own efforts and works and you feel pretty good about yourself about three weeks in because you haven't been sinning and you pat yourself on the back and you go, boy, I feel so rejuvenated now because I've done so well. The problem is, is you're counting on you and you're only setting yourself up for a big fall again because you're human flesh and you're going to make those, those faults. You're going to sin. I want you to know that our renewal is not found in ourself. Our renewal is found in Christ and Him alone. It's coming to Him for the renewal, right? And we used the illustration, and I think this was kind of one of those aha moments those where the light came on. I talked about whether you take a shower or a bath, not discriminate from one group or the other. I don't know what you do probably, but I think most people take showers, right? How many of you take a shower rather than a bath, all right? I mean, not that you never take a bath, but okay, how many of you take a bath? Let's see. No, my mom, mom raised you again. You know that's what, all right, that's been her whole life. She's, she takes a bath. And I, I just, to me, that feels dirty. I feel like I'm getting in water and getting it dirty, and then I get up out, and it like films back over me as I get out. And I'm just backing out what I put in. So I like a shower personally. I just do, but that's personal preference. The rest of you can stay dirty. But anyway, here's the thing. Here's the thing, is that the reason we get in the shower is because, because we're clean, right? No, we get in the shower because we're, we're dirty. And so if we get in the shower because we're dirty, uh, would it ever be the mind, if your shower had a mind, would it ever be the mind of your shower to, to think, oh my goodness, why is it that the only time you ever come to me is when you're dirty? Matter of fact, note to you, clean up a little bit before you come to me. You think your shower would ever say that if it could say anything? No. You know why it wouldn't? Because it was made for cleansing and cleaning. It was made for that. Matter of fact, when you get in dirty, it's going, yes, this is awesome. I'm getting to do what, I, what I'm designed to do. I'm made here to bring cleansing and clean. And yet the scripture says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to do what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And yet we give more respect to our shower, not thinking that it cares, but yet we have this attitude that God, the creator of all things, who designed a perfect way for us to find cleansing, not just once a day, as I hope you do taking a bath or shower, but uh, you can come every moment of every day. No matter how dirty, no matter how awful, terrible decisions you made, whether you did it intentionally with malice or whether you did it unintentionally and just found yourself in a place you never intended to be. It 
doesn't matter. God has made available to us the ability to come and to confess our sins, to make it right with him. And never does God say, hey, hey, wait a minute. You know what? You've come to me 15 gazillion times dirty for the same reason, and I just want to tell you, I want you to clean up a little bit before you come back to me. And you'd say that's ridiculous. A shower wouldn't say that to you, but why do we say that God treats us that way? A shower can't think. It can't love. He is love. He would never say that. His arms are open wide, ready to receive everyone who comes to him to cleanse us, to make us right and holy. But only can we do that in him and him alone. I don't know about you, but that little illustration, every time I take a shower, I can't help but think of that simple truth that God has provided for us the gift of forgiveness by his blood and his cleansing. And only Satan, if you listen to him, will cause you not to get in the shower. Only Satan doesn't want you to go to Jesus. Only Satan. So if you're not going to him, don't feel like somehow you're, you're self deprivation I didn't say that word right, your self-denial, your self What's that? Somebody said something. I'm willing to hear it if you throw it out there. Yourself, yourself uh, cleansing, yourself justifying. At the end of the day, if you feel better about the fact that, well, now, now I have punished myself long enough, now I can go to God. What you're doing is you're not accepting the free gift of God's forgiveness and you're trying to substitute it with your own persecution. As though somehow or another that's more valuable than the persecution Christ went through on the cross for you already. See, he said it's finished. Now, I don't know. Last time I read it's finished, I think it's finished means it's done. I think that's what that means. You're baking a cake and somebody says, hey, the cake's finished. You better pull it out of the oven. It's done. Anything beyond that's going to destroy it. What God's done is enough. That's a beautiful thing of the work of the cross. So, I'm not here to re-preach that message, but I could, if you see. I, I, I'm very passionate about that. This, the next thing that we talked about last week was freedom from the power of sin, and I'll give you one word, selfie. Remember we talked about selfie and how that we live in a world today where we take all these selfies and we make sure that they, and, and, and of course, the reason why people like to take selfies, if you didn't know this, and I know that you do know it, but you just may not have thought about it, is because we can make sure that we take the right angle and the right picture, and if we don't like it, we can delete it and do it again, delete it and do it again, delete it and do it again, until we finally go, yep, that's it. That makes me look better than I really am. And then we post it. And it's a selfie. But what is a selfie? A selfie is a self-examination because we don't like what other people see sometimes and we don't want them taking the picture. In this regard, as a selfie, God wants us to examine our own heart and to know where we stand with God. Take that selfie, examine yourself and know that you're in the position of surrender and humility before God. Examine yourself. Now here in just a little bit, I'm gonna have my deacons to come and I'm going to have them to be here in the front because we're going to be serving uh, the elements here this morning. And so uh, rather than waiting until it's time, I would rather to save some commotion and, and some movement if possible for those that are able. Now I realize, Joe, you're on sound, and you might have to stay there until. But uh, those that uh, are, are my deacons, uh, if they would come in and just sit here on the front pew, that would be awesome. All right? Um, now, here's the thing is that we find ourselves in that place where we have to do a self-examination, and that's important, knowing where our life is between us and God. But if you remember, one of the things that I stated last week was that prayer is always, it is always the passageway to freedom. Did you hear me? Everybody right here. Prayer is always the passageway to freedom. If you want to understand freedom in your life, you have to understand prayer and the power of prayer because it is the pathway of our forgiveness. Apart from prayer, forgiveness can't be had. Thus, 
confess, the Bible says, if we confess our sin, if we pray and talk to God, let him know, confessing to him our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the first word in that verse is what? If. If we pray, forgiveness can be had. Prayer is always the pathway to freedom. Don't lose that. That's really important. So as we have found, looking in this subject, we have to come to that place where we realize that in our self-examination, we can find self-examination, self-determination, but also self-desolation. And everything is centered around what? Self, right? And when our life is consistently centered around ourself, we're not following Jesus, we're following our own way of thinking. And that's a dangerous place to be. And I talked to you last week about the dangers of overthinking. I know we don't live in a world where people overthink anything anymore days. We overthink ourselves into depression, brokenheartedness, diseases that rivet our body because we can't quit thinking. We overthink. Thinking's important, but overthinking is dangerous. Thus Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll take care of it. A little modern twist there. He'll take care of it. It's all good. Just trust the Lord. Follow him. Depend on him. This morning I want to talk to you in this area of forgiveness of sin. Um, I want you to know that... Um, not only do we have to do a self-examination, but we also have to understand it is an individual thing in finding that freedom from the power of sin, but also it's a collective thing. And freedom from the power of sin is also reliant on us supporting one another. That's majorly important. Support one another. Now, let, let me just say, before I go into this passage, and you can turn with me to James chapter 5, and we're going to kind of crack that open a little bit this morning uh, and unpack this verse some, but here's what I want you to know. This last week, my dad, last week, for those that were here, he was, he was doing so bad he didn't even come to church last week. He was really not doing well at all. He is physically just going downhill, and he said, I, every day I feel worse and worse, and he really felt like his days were numbered and they were, and it was coming fast. And so mom went home to be with him after she played the piano here at the beginning of the service in the first service and she went home to be with him. But I'd already talked to the deacons about us going over to dad's house on Sunday evening and, and just anointing him and having prayer over him. But then when dad wasn't here that Sunday morning, I got on the phone and well, I talked to the deacons here at church. I said, guys, we got to get together. It's time is of the essence we need to go and have prayer over dad and anoint him as the scripture says to do in James and so we did and so I want to take these verses and I want you to hear the verses uh, that we read when we went over to meet with them and the scripture reads beginning in verse number 13 is anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing praise is anyone among you sick let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will, uh, he will be forgiven. Now, honestly, I, I have to admit to you, I have, when I've looked at these verses, I've kind of stopped there never really looked beyond that until it was pointed out to me to consider verse 16 there in the importance of verse 16 and I believe it's verse 16 and verse 17 well no just verse 16 I believe it's really important for us not to leave this verse out listen to what it says it says the prayer of a righteous or verse number 16 and uh, verse number 16 therefore confess your what your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. Now 
listen, I don't, I doubt there's too many people in this congregation this morning who doesn't want a healing in your life, okay? And that may take all kinds of shapes and forms. It may be you're dealing with an illness or, a, or, or an, an ailment or a sickness, or it may be that you have a broken heart over something or, or whatever it might be. There may be a need for healing in your life, a strength that you need a renewal within you that you don't have. And, and I want to say, I, I know when we read that verse, we might think a healing as being over sickness and over ailments and all. I believe it goes much deeper than that. I believe it's, a, it's whatever our need is for healing. Now, I don't think it's wrong to ask God to heal our, our, our hips or our back or whatever physically might be wrong with us. I don't think there's anything in the world wrong with that. Matter of fact, there's oftentimes I pray, God, Please relieve this headache I got right now. Anybody ever done that? Huh? Okay. What's that's healing over a physical issue? If it's wrong to ask for anything, don't ask for that either. There's nothing wrong with that. God wants us to bring our knees to Him, our hurts, our pains. He does. But the ultimate purpose of our prayer is should not be self. It should be the will of God, whatever that looks like. God, you tell me in, in your word. He tells each and every one of us in his word to let our requests be made known unto God. So in this human frail body, I'm gonna make my request known to God. God, I want you to heal my dad. I want you to do, I want this cancer to take a back seat to your strength and your power. I want that. That's what I want humanly. And it's okay that I ask for that. But the end of my prayer is not about what I want God to do, but to accept who God is and accept what he chooses to do. And if you pray and the end of your prayer is about what you want, then you're praying, I'll use the term in an unworthy manner. You're basing the center of your prayer on your desire rather than the will of the Father. See, Jesus requested in the garden when he was getting ready to go to the cross, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. The cup was the death on the cross. He was saying, God, let this cup, let this, what's about to come, let it not happen, God. Let this cup pass from me. But he went on to say, not my will, thy will be done. Now here's the point in all that. God knew, more importantly, that the death of Jesus was crucial for you and I. And I'm thankful that God fulfilled that plan because all of us would be hopeless today apart from Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Let me just say, we don't always know the end of things, so we have to depend on God to perform what's best in the end. And we have to be okay with that. doesn't mean we always have to like it. I'm sure Jesus still didn't go, okay, well, I like the cross coming. No, I'm sure it wasn't something he liked. Matter of fact, the scripture tells us that Christ died of a broken heart. We know that. Uh, the medical field tells us that any time that a person, when they die, if blood and water flows out of their body, it's known that they died of a broken heart. There's been an issue there. Broken hearts happen. Jesus died of a broken heart. Is When he died, he didn't die of a broken heart. He died with a broken heart for you and for me. But at the end of the day, the will of the Father is most important. Now, newsflash, you ready? Newsflash, we talked about this a few weeks back and it was during our Easter service. Newsflash, Lazarus died. Now you say, I know Lazarus died. That's why Jesus came and raised him from the dead. No, no, I'm talking about after that, Lazarus died. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. At the end of the day, my prayers for God's healing on my dad, when we went, we were praying for healing for my dad, but I also want you to understand this. I realize that healing doesn't mean he's gonna live for eternity now. But what we're praying is God extend his opportunity of life on this earth, and that's what God did with Lazarus. He extended his time, but he still didn't give him life forever on this earth. Lazarus died. 
understand that in our prayers, we have to be careful that we're not asking God for certain things and then God provides it for us and then a little bit later, something changes. We go, well, pfft, well God, why'd you give it to me if you were just gonna take it away from me anyway? How selfish we are not to be thankful for what time God provides above and beyond what we have. So I believe it's a time of self-examination that we have to have. We have to realize and get real with ourselves and understand that in confessing, that we are confessing our faults one to another, realizing that we are not in the place that we should be, that we are struggling with things in our own life. And at the end of the day, here's the whole point of it, we need one another. We can't do this by ourselves. We have to be in a community of faith. That's why God designed the church, which is the movement, which was the game changer from the Old Testament way to the New Testament way. It's the game changer. Changed everything. We need each other. So if we need each other, we need to learn how to rely on each other and trust each other and to pray for one another and to support one another. So I want you to know, as the deacons got together, First thing I did was after this had kind of been brought out to me, I got to study it and look at it. I thought, you know what? It says there in verse 16 to confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And so I told the men, I said, here's what we're going to do. I want to have a time of silent prayer and I want each of you to pray in your own heart and whatever it is between you and God, you need to pray and confess that to the Lord and seek to make that right with him. But then when we're done, I also want you to pray that God will give you the boldness to share with us as a group the struggle you're dealing with. It's really the heavy struggle in your life that you're dealing with and in order that we can pray for you collectively as a group. So we had a time of silent prayer, three, four minutes or so, and then I just said, amen. Who wants to be first? And around the room it started, and even Dad confessed what he's struggling with the most right now, where he's at. And we each confessed. And then I said, let's have prayer once again, and here's what I want us to do. I want each of you to remember one person and what they confessed here, and I want you to pray for that one person, and let's pray for one another. And so we went from individual prayer to praying for one another and we prayed for each other and those needs. By the time we were done, some of the men were weeping and the work of God was happening. Then after we got to that place, I said, okay, now it's time for us collectively, now that we've laid the foundation that God says is supposed to be there for healing to happen and for God to do something, now it's time for us to lay our hands on dad and anoint him and pray over him and ask God to do something. So we got up and we joined together around dad. Every single one of us anointed him with oil. He was dripping oil by the time he was done. He had, he had oil on him and we put our hands on him and we prayed and every one of us prayed. I just want you to know, my dad woke up the next day. He had a good night's sleep, hadn't been sleeping very well at all. He slept. He naturally gets up through the night and has to, but he said every time he got up, he was able to go right back to sleep again when he woke up. And, and then he went back to bed. He was able to go right back to sleep again. Next day he got up. They had company. He said, Bud, he said, you know, he had his medicine laying on the table. He said, you know, maybe I don't need to take that anymore. He's telling me this on the phone. I said, oh, yes, you do. You take that medicine. What are you talking about? Now, you might say, Pastor, whoa, wait a minute. I thought God, he yeah, you know what? You can be on top of a roof and a flood comes, and you're going, God, save me, and here comes a boat. You know, nah, you know what? God's going to save me. Here comes a helicopter. Oh, God will save me. And then you drown. You get to heaven. You go, God, why didn't you save me? I sent you a boat, and I sent you a helicopter. I tried to save you, didn't give me a chance. I said, this might be your helicopter, your boat. You take your medicine. I don't know how God's gonna bring this for you, but you just trust God. That's the key. We don't trust the medicine, we trust God. 
So I say that because I want you to understand, be careful when you listen to people talk about faith healing and all that. Now get off your mouth and get ready to listen. That's dangerous. You need to make sure you do the right thing. Trust God always, regardless if you're taking medicine or not. Trust God. He's the healer. He can bring it however he wants to bring it. But he felt good. And every day he improved. And he's felt better every day. Now, there was a healing. I really believe there was a healing. Now, is it a permanent healing? And he's now going to live forever? No, I don't believe that to be true. But I do believe a healing came over my dad. I really do. Mom will tell you, he's had strength this week. He's, he's had spirit to him where... I mean, last Sunday, his spirit was gone. His will to keep going was gone. And God did some remarkable things for him. But I want to tell you, have we just walked in the room, and I told the men, if we just come in, lay our hands on him, anoint him with oil, and pray over him, and yet we've not laid the proper foundation of what the scripture says we need to do for that healing to take place, then we're wasting our time to be here and pray has to be a willingness to be humble and confess our faults one to another so that we can pray for one another because none of us deserve to go to the throne room ever it's only by God's grace that we can and so this passage here was the passage we shared and we and we went through this and so here's what I want you to get in verse number 16 it says therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. If you want a healing, my friend, and every one of us want a healing, if we want a healing, we got to be willing to come and confess that we have needs to be forgiven. We have a need to confess our fault one to another. Now, I'm not saying just pick any yahoo out of the crowd and go tell them uh, something you're struggling with in your life. No, I'm saying be wise to search out and know somebody who loves God, somebody who will go to the throne room for you. And you find that person and you connect with them and you ask for them to pray for you and you share your burden and confess to them what you're dealing with. I believe that God's meant for us to be a community. Now, once again, I want to put some perimeters on this so you understand what I think. There's good and there's best. It's good that you find a believer that you share something with who loves Jesus, who, who, who has prayer as an important part of their life, and you know they're not going to be a person who brings judgment on you, but somebody who's going to love you and pray for you. And maybe you don't know altogether. They kind of have signs of that. You sometimes got to step out in faith and trust that God will lead you to the right people. But at the end, of, that's good. But at the end of the day, what's great, what's great, not just good, but great, is to find somebody within the congregation of the church in your community of faith, not outside somebody else's church or community, because if we're going to grow as a family, what's great is when we can do that with each other. You see what I'm saying? Again, I'm not saying it's you're, you're totally off or wrong if there's somebody outside church, whatever, but our church will miss out on something if you take it somewhere else. We have an ability for God to forgive us as a congregation of things that maybe we don't even realize need to be forgiven. But as we confess our fault one to another, we begin to realize the things within ourselves that need prayer and need help and need a loving arm. And that's what we want to do as a church. Now, today we're going to take of, of the elements. And in doing so, I just... I. I you can turn with me to 1 Corinthians, that's fine. Or you can just listen, it'll be here on the screen. But I, I want you to, to get the concept of this passage because here's what we find. That the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And the reason he took bread is this is a symbolic illustration of something that was just about ready to take place. That Jesus' body was going to be broken. That his blood was going to be shed on the cross of Calvary. And that it is only through his broken body and his shed blood is there ever the ability to have the forgiveness of sin. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so symbolically, Jesus was showing his disciples what was about to happen. Now we take of the elements because it is a reflection of what Jesus has already done for us and has 
broken body and his shed blood on the cross of Calvary for us. This is not literally, it does not become his body and his blood. It's a grape juice and it's, and it's bread, unleavened bread. There's a whole significance between the unleavened, not going there right now. These are only elements that are symbolic for us in receiving the Lord's body, his body that was broken and his blood for us. Now, having said that, in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 27, here's what I want to point out to you. It says in verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there anything you can do within yourself? Everybody right here for a minute. Is there anything that anybody in this room can do to make yourself worthy? Okay. Can we? Can we make ourselves worthy? We cannot make ourselves worthy because if we could, we don't need Jesus. If my performance pleases the Father to the point where he accepts me because of who I am and what I've done, then Jesus was a fool to have died on the cross. But I can't find well. I can't, listen, what does worthy mean? Worthy has to do with worth, right? Can I find any worth inside myself? Am I worth anything apart from Jesus? Am I? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And, and just to make sure that, because again, I, I know that we can find ourselves being careless not to live in a way that brings honor and pleasure to the Lord, but at the end of the day, my worth is not found in anything I do with my own hands, ever. My worth is always found in Christ and Him alone, period. Always. That's crucial that you get that, you understand this. So when it says that if I take of the body and the blood of Jesus or I receive the, it's these elements, symbolically receive these elements, and, and again, I say symbolically, it's not even necessarily taking of this bread and this cup. It's claiming to have taken the body and blood of Jesus as forgiveness of my sin. And if I take that unworthily, then I bring up on my own self-damnation. Listen to what it says there. It says in this verse, in verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28 goes on to say, and in the King James it says, uh, well, let's read this. It says, let a person examine himself, then so eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, in the King James, it used the word but, and I like the word but, but let a man examine himself. And here's the thing. I like the word but because the scripture says if you take it unworthily that you've done it wrong, but, in other words, forget what I just said. Here's what you need to do. Just examine yourself. Make it right with God. Get yourself in a place where you have accepted your worth found on him, not on yourself. So therefore, there's not a single person in this auditorium, if you're a born-again believer, that should, should let this cup pass you by or this bread pass you by because you say, well, you know, I got some things in my life I, I just got to make right until I make them right. Then at the end of the day, I'm not worthy. Listen, even if you were here today and you were doing everything 100% right and you were patting yourself on the back for it because, hey, I'm in right standings with God because look how good I'm living and all that I'm doing, you're still unworthy to take that because you're finding your worth in yourself and not in Christ. Our worth is found in Jesus alone, period. So I don't care if you're on a mountaintop with the Lord and everything's going great for you, you just approach this with the idea and understanding that my worth is not found in any of these good things that I've been able to do because I couldn't do them apart from the strength of God helping me to do them. So really it's all because of God and therefore my worth is found in him and I can take. Or if you find yourself in that place of, wow, 
Pastor, you just don't understand the choices I made last night, though. If you only knew, then you would probably tell me to let it pass me by. At the end of the day, folks, I don't care what horrible choices you made last night. Your worst not found in your ability to perform, but it's found in Christ and Him alone. And you receive it because of Him. Him alone. The scripture says, this is our attitude as we approach this moment of receiving these elements. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have the men to come. And you know what? Thank you, uh, those that watch this online. That's great. We're going to shut things down now. We're just going to have our time together.